but I noticed I couldn't um, like read or anything like that. My right side, my right side was, um, yeah, was quite weak. Um, so I couldn't like hold a glass or anything like that. I could move it, um, but yeah, and I couldn't walk at all. This is Recovery After Stroke with Bill Gassiamis, helping you go from where you are to where you'd rather be. Bill Gassiamis here. This is episode 96, and my guest today is Jessica Lepper. Jessica was a 22-year-old nurse on shift in hospital when she noticed herself not being able to speak due to a ruptured AVM. Since then, Jessica has had to overcome a lot to get back to work and is now being monitored due to seizures now, just before we get started with the interview, I wanted to thank everyone that reaches out to me to send me lovely feedback and to share how much each episode has helped them or made a difference in their life. It's so heartwarming to hear from you. And if you felt like reaching out before, but you haven't yet, I'd love to hear from you. This podcast is for you and me, and I do this work because I love what I get from it, I get so much satisfaction and it makes my life better. And that's why the podcast exists. And I hope that that's what it does for you. If you feel like shit from time to time, I hope that it makes you feel better. If you are feeling alone, I hope that it makes you feel somehow more connected. If you feel isolated, you're not alone. Just reach out. You can send me an email, bill at recoveryafterstroke.com. I answer all my emails personally. Also, If you love the Recovery After Stroke podcast and you think it's helpful, please share it and tell others about the podcast so that they may benefit too. If you're watching on YouTube, please give us a thumbs up and leave a comment. I love to hear from other stroke survivors. And again, I answer all my comments personally. Go to iTunes or your favorite podcast app and also give us a five-star review there. That'll help search engines find it better and put it out to more people. Also, if you want to follow me on Instagram, just go to instagram.com slash recoveryafterstroke or or facebook.com slash recoveryafterstroke. Finally, I wanted to let you know that you can now also download all the words of each episode as a PDF. It's perfect for you if you prefer to read and take notes or highlight different parts of the interview for future reference. It's a great way to learn and it helps retain new information to memory. Just go to recoveryafterstroke.com, click the image of the episode you've just listened to, and at the very beginning of the page, you will see a button that says Download Transcript. Click the button, enter your email address, and the PDF, and the PDF will begin downloading. Now it's on with the show. Jess Lappert, welcome to the sure. podcast. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> hey, Jess, thanks so much for being on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Can we just start with you telling us a little bit about what happened to you? Yeah, sure. Um, So long story short, um, I was a nurse at um, a hospital in London and I was just talking to a patient and my words started to slur and then I completely lost um, my voice um, and I thought that was a bit weird. Um, So then we, uh, I got sent to Charing Cross, which is a neurological centre in London and they confirmed that I had a AVM rupture, which caused um, me to have a stroke, really. <laughs> wow, how old were you at the time? 22, so quite young. I think that's why they didn't really know what, what was going on, really. Yeah, were you with your, um, were you with professional people around there? Was there other nurses and doctors around at the time that it happened? Yeah, I was so lucky, so lucky. Yeah. Do you have any recollection of after you couldn't speak? Do you have any recollection about how you, how that were were you? What was the? What am I trying to say? Like I'm trying to say is, did you notice yourself not being able to speak? Yeah, yeah. I could. I was thinking what I was trying to say, but I literally there was no ver- verbal coming out of my mouth. Really, yeah. So you were at hospital for work. You had a um, yeah. you had a, an AVM rupture and you found yourself yeah. uh, being in the best place at the right time. Was yeah. was it CT scan immediately? What happened after that? Yeah, so I was, um, 
I went downstairs to A and E, and they rushed me in and was like, "This is not weird. This is so like weird." Um, and they rushed me in ambulance to the neurological center, and I had a CT scan straight away, and yeah, it confirmed a stroke or brain hemorrhage. Yeah, so. Wow. So what happened after that? What was the process that they took you through? Um, they started me on um, Kepra, which is a seizure med, um, just in case I had a seizure. Um, and I was bed bound. They said, like, I can't move or anything. Um, and then I was sent up to the neurological ward. Yeah. And then, yeah, that's where it all happened, really. <laughs> that's where the story starts, really. Did you have surgery after that? Yeah, I did. Um, I had a craniotomy to remove to remove the AVM. Um, and um, it didn't really go to plan, to be honest. <laughs> wow. The um, operation was meant to take about five hours, but um, I had a hemorrhage on the table again. So it took about nine hours um, and I ended up in ITU. Um, and the surgeon spoke to my parents and said like, he wasn't sure how my condition would be. He said like, I probably won't, won't walk, talk, like I'm probably not gonna be as normal as I was before, which, yeah. Wow, so when you woke up, how long, how long mm. after your surgery, do you have any recollection of how long it was after you kind of woke up and started to realize that you're in a hospital bed? I was, I woke up um, and I just saw my parents like waving through the door and then that's it. That's all I can really remember. Um, the ITU experience, I can't really remember to be honest. Yeah, wow, that is fascinating. Before the stroke happened or before the hemorrhage uh, occurred, was there any signs leading up to that day to go to work? Did you have any idea that perhaps there was something serious going on in your body? No, so I was in Australia um, 73 hours before that and living my life, like living the dream. And then I went home to Devon, no sign of anything. And then went to work, felt fine. And then suddenly, click, and then that's it. It's so weird so unexpected and so young and everybody's going everyone's probably freaking out how do your family cope with all this sudden drama and, and emergency well they live in devon which is um about four, four or five hours away from london um and they got the call and i think they didn't really know the situation until they got there um and they were all quite like really positive and you know kept me like positive and didn't stress me out but I think behind the scenes everyone was um yeah pretty so <laughs> you woke up from surgery how were what did you notice about what was different about your body did you have any idea of what was different what was happening to you um not really to be honest I Speech wasn't actually changed, um, so it was quite minimal, but I could still like do some hand actions, um, but I noticed I couldn't um, like read or anything like that. And yeah, so that's really sad really. <laughs> Did you have um, any problems walking, yeah. any numbness on, on, on any one of your limbs or anything like that? Oh yeah, my right side, my right side was, um, yeah, was quite weak. Um, so I couldn't like hold a glass or anything like that. I could move it, um, but yeah, and I couldn't walk at all. And did you have to have rehabilitation as a result of that? Yeah, um, physio, yeah, which was, yeah, quite hard. Cause I probably was bed bound for like two weeks. Cause I had to, um, obviously do my ITU experience which was like a week and then I was moved to HGU and then I was like bag bound and then the physio started getting me out but oh, it was a nightmare really. Yeah. What's, yeah. I, what's ITU and HGU? 
Oh, sorry. Intensive care. <laughs> sorry. Yep. And HGU is? High dependency. Ah. So it's just a step down from the, yeah, yep. IT, um, IT, intensive care. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Right. Okay. So then did you have some time at rehabilitation? Was it two weeks in rehabilitation? Um, so I probably spent four weeks on um, high dependency. Um, and then I had speech and language every day. And the occupational therapist um, actually saw me quite a lot because my short term memory was like literally gone. I couldn't remember anything. Wow, how long ago was this now? So we're in, it's um, April 2020. When when did this all happen? January the 31st, 2019. Yeah, so last year. It's been a year. Mm, yeah, I'm so lucky to be honest, but yeah. Yeah, we are. What were the main things that you had to relearn how to do again? I guess my speech was one of the main things and I probably still struggle with that at times, especially when I'm tired. So when I went home from um, the hospital, I had like intensive um, speech and language. Um, yeah, for quite a long time. Um, yeah, which was tricky at times, but we got through it. <laughs> yeah. What did it mean for your driving and just being a normal person for a for on you know like a daily on a daily basis what did that mean for what you could no longer do um so i couldn't drive um at all and i now have epilepsy as a consequence so i can't drive at all now until i didn't have a seizure for a year and is the epilepsy um something that you notice coming on is it something serious that occurs or is it something that you can manage and control when you when when you become aware of it? Um, to be honest, I literally get no signs at all. Um, so I just like fall on the floor and that's all I can remember really. Wow, and, and you like, on the floor, have you hurt yourself doing that at all? The first time, yeah, I did, but I can usually manage to get on the floor. I literally have like five seconds and then it all starts, yeah. And then you need people around you to help you recover from that. How does that work? Yeah, 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 yeah. So usually it's like an ambulance has to come because they literally last like 40 minutes. It's not like a quick like two minutes or anything. It's yeah, quite intense. <laughs> right. And does it require hospitalization as well? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. So you've been through quite a tough time and it seems like you're still going through a tough time is it getting better what are you noticing about um what's getting better for you yeah definitely um my speech is like you if you didn't know me you probably think like i'm just a normal person and this is my speech um sometimes it i have to think about my what i'm saying um and sometimes the words don't come out <laughs> um my walking's absolutely fine. I'm so lucky with that. Um, and it's just the epilepsy in the speech, really, um, that have really been affected, but yeah. And have you been able to get back to work as a result of the time that's passed since you've had a stroke, or are you not back at work yet? I actually went back to work on February the 3rd, so basically a year after my stroke. Um, as a nurse um but obviously with this situation going on um, i'm back in devon for now and then we'll see what happens <laughs> how do you find being back at work now that you're a stroke survivor you're somebody who's got a real experience of something really dramatic even at the age of 22 how do you find going back to work um i was relieved to be back because to be honest, we didn't think I'd ever work again. Um, and I was with, I'm with the same team, so everyone knows me. And I had a lot of visitors during my time, um, at, like in the flat in Wimbledon. Um, so everyone knew the situation and were really, really helpful. Um, 
it's a bit weird going back to the place it happened and that took me a while but other than that and I also forgot that the AVM to um st like um go back a bit um the AVM wasn't completely removed so I had to have gamma knife I don't know if you know what that is no tell me a little bit about that is that radiation yeah it's radiation um just to zap away the AVM hopefully but it w works um really slowly so it probably takes about five years um and then we'll ha have to see whether it's working <laughs> and do you have to have ongoing uh gamma knife procedures so after the five years um they'll do an angiogram and then we'll see how it is and if if i um if it's still there then we'll have to do another cycle but Hopefully it won't be there. <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed. So what happened with the surgery though? So you still had a craniotomy. I saw the scar on Instagram. It was quite an awesome scar. What yeah, yeah, crazy. What, what was the outcome of the surgery? What did that achieve? Um, so that was to, it was hopefully to remove the AVM, um, but it was too deep. So they've removed quite a lot of it, but um some of it still remains. <laughs> right, okay. So they've gone in and they've decided to not go any further and then leave mm. it be, get you out of the hospital, get you recovering and then treat it with a gamma knife so that it's less invasive. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. Yeah, yeah. cool. Tell me, this whole experience has made you a better nurse? Yeah. I'd say, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes you think you empathise more and you think about things like, you know, the parents and um, how they're feeling. Because sometimes you just, you know, it's so busy, you just get on with it and you're just focusing on the child. But actually, you really need to focus on the parent as well because if they're not positive and you know, resilient, then the child's not going to get better as soon, like, as quickly. You know how you're a nurse and you have all this inside information about medical stuff? Does that make you feel yeah. better about what you've learnt about your experience? Or because you know what you know, does it give you some kind of a sense of underlying concern? No. I think during the whole experience, obviously, I knew like my observations and whether they were normal or so, like not but actually that made me actually it made it made me understand the situation more I think um because obviously I knew what was going on really because some people obviously wouldn't know would they so yeah no, they wouldn't have a clue I'm the kind of guy that needs a whole bunch of information I need to know everything I need to ask all the questions whether it's good or bad do you find that being a nurse gave you that opportunity to really be in control a little bit about the information? And is that a good thing for you? I think because at the time I couldn't speak, it was quite frustrating because obviously I wanted to know, like you said, everything that was going on. But obviously I could, couldn't could express myself. Yep. So we had like a word board to try and like I could spell the things I wanted to say but obviously if it's co quite complex then obviously I couldn't <laughs> yeah then it becomes harder to communicate what you want and it takes mm. a lot longer so yeah. what what were some of the things that you wanted to communicate that you couldn't get the message across for I guess as a nurse I wanted to know the drugs and you know the classic um how the dosages and stuff like that but obviously I couldn't ask that yeah why did you feel you needed to know the the type of um medication you're on and the doses I think obviously because like the Kepra and stuff um obviously that's like an anti-seizure one um and Obviously, I know like the steroids and stuff like that, obviously, that I was on. But I just wanted to know the dose because obviously I know how like serious it is or not yeah, not as serious. <laughs> yeah, I see what you're saying. Now, as a girl with beautiful blonde hair, long hair, <laughs> at, 
how did yeah. you deal with the whole the whole they're going to cut my hair situation or were you aware of that or did you just kind of work that out later and then yeah I think yeah it's one of those things you just have to get over don't you I think you know we had to do the surgery otherwise I'd probably have another stroke so we just thought we've got to like, get on with it really <laughs> and I could cover it up so yeah it's basically gone now so that's good so what did they do just take out the bit that they were going to um, do the incision on yeah, so the surgeon was really good. He just literally did from here back to my ear, and that's it. He didn't like shave anything that doesn't need to be shaved. So I got quite lucky. <laughs> I got to prepare myself for the um, for the surgery. I was told that we're going to have surgery on this particular day, so I went and got the um, got the hairdresser to give me a number zero, like basically what I've got now, but completely. Yeah, yeah. And the funniest, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, and the funniest thing happened because it was a, it was a, I think it wasn't actually a, z- a zero, it was a number one. Um, it was really, really short everywhere. And then it was shaved in the area where they opened my head up. And then as, yeah, it, yeah. as it started to grow back, I had this really weird look. It was um, kind of long and then it had like a line and it looked really bizarre and strange. So four yeah, days yeah. after my surgery, I had to shave it again so I don't look too silly. Oh, really? <laughs> how how is yours healed? Yeah, it's 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 healed amazing. It's been um, it's been uh, four years or so, and you can't yeah, really, yeah you can't really see it at all. No, no, not at all. Yeah, if I cut my hair really short, where from time to time I do, you can see it. It does um, come through, but not a lot. The hair has mainly mm-hmm. grown back. Oh, that's good. That's so good, isn't yeah. it? So with you, is it visible at mm-hmm. all or only when you move your hair um, back? Yeah, probably just when I move that, my hair back, which to be honest, if you didn't know, yeah. like you just think it's a little bit of bold, you know, patch, which, you know, people have, don't they? So, yeah, yeah. I'm quite lucky. For all different reasons, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, exactly. So tell me about the next few years. What are they like for you? What have you got planned to do and achieve I think just to work getting my new normal routine back because obviously I'm, I was living in Devon um, for like six months last year um so it's get, getting used to being in the flat on my own because I don't really like being on my own now um and we've got a alarm fitted so I can um press it if I need an, any assistance yeah um and then just seeing how it goes, really, um, to be honest, yeah. Yeah, has it impacted your relationships with your friends or did you have a boyfriend or a partner or anything like that? Um, with my friends, they're amazing. I think it's brought us all closer, to be honest, because um, at times like these, you really realise who's there, don't you? Um, I'm sure you realise that too. Yeah. I think one of the biggest things that happened for me was I really realized who are the ones that would say something like, if there's anything you need, let me know. And when I asked mm-hmm. for their help, they really actually stepped up and made a difference. And they actually, yeah, yeah. Uh, they surprised me. But when I asked them, they actually said, yes. Did you find that as well? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And just from for their just from their being um in the house and in the flat and stuff like it made my communication better because I was always talking and communicating with someone else other than my family so that was really good actually yeah were you with a partner at the time if you've had a stroke and are in recovery you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be you're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind like How long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously because you've never had a stroke before, you probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called Seven Questions to Ask Your Doctor About Your Stroke.
These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com and download the guide. It's free. No, no. But since then, yeah. <laughs> since then, yeah. So you're living with somebody now and was how soon did you make him aware of what your challenges were? Well, he was just on the scene before. <laughs> and then um and then and then after the stroke, um he didn't see you for quite a while because obviously everything was happening. And then yeah, he obviously was told quite a lot of things, but yeah, he probably doesn't, you know, when I have my Instagram account, sometimes he's like, oh, that happened. And yeah, he didn't really know some things. So he's, <laughs> he's catching up on all of the uh, juicy details now rather than earlier on. Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. <laughs> Does he find it weird when you start a sentence and can't get to the end of it, when you forget what you're going to say or? No, he's quite understanding to be honest. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because I guess he knew he saw me at probably my worst of my speaking. Um, so obviously, it's definitely a lot better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. How how are you affected now? A lot of people that experience a stroke experience some kind of other challenges. You know, um, uh, anxiety or things like that. Did you find any challenges with your mental health or anything like that? To be honest, I think I'm quite lucky. I think. The only time that I created is not being able to go to things like nights out and stuff like that. I probably can't do that anymore. Um, but my friends are really understanding and stuff like that. So I'm quite lucky and my family are really supportive and, you know, um, they taught me to like be like really positive and stuff like that. So to be honest, it hasn't really affected me yeah. at the moment. You never know what's going to happen, do you? But yeah, at the moment, I'm all good. Thank you. Awesome. And what's interesting is that you're not able to go out because of the stroke. And now none of us are able to go out because of this other thing that's happening around the planet. Um, I so know, it's, it's crazy. Isn't it? It's no real different, is it? Um, no real difference. No, no. Tell me, however, tell me about your um, reason why you couldn't go out at nights. What was stopping you from being able to be out at a, at a club, for example? Um, cause obviously with this, this epilepsy now, I can't really drink. Um, and sometimes it's my tiredness that affects me and that's when I have, um, a fit. Yeah. So I really don't want to <laughs> risk it to be honest. <laughs> yeah. So it's better to be cautious. And do you find that lights or noise, like the, the sounds, music that affects you? No, not at all, actually. I'm quite lucky. At the beginning, like lights, I hate, I l literally hated them. Sometimes um, if I have like the spot lights, um, I don't like that. But other than that, yeah, I'm quite, it's fine, really, yeah. Well, it's amazing. I saw the scan on Instagram of your, of the bleed in your brain. That was quite a yeah. scan that took up, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And did that happen really rapidly? Did it become that big, that bleed very rapidly? Mm, yeah. Yeah, it's so crazy. Like when you show a doctor now, they're like, God, how do you survive that? Like, it's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. It's really amazing. It just goes to show that every stroke is different and, and every person is different. But there's real hope in having a conversation with you and getting to know you a little bit. There's such an mm. amount of hope for people that are uh, freshly going through this or have just, um, you know, who knows somebody who's just gone through this. There's such a, a, a great amount of hope that people can work on recovering and get better and getting back to some yeah. kind of a, a normal life. And now this mm. experience, I wouldn't wish it ever upon anybody, but, but isn't it amazing that this experience that has happened to a nurse who's 20 something years old can now yeah. support her in doing a better job mm. while she's caring for other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, and that's why I wanted to create that Instagram account because, you know, we need to be positive and, you know, share our experiences. So, you know, people, you know, you've you've got to get through it, haven't you? You've got to hope and, yeah. So what do your family and parents think? Are they uh, keeping an eye on you? Are they fussing over you? How are they behaving now that it's been a year mm. that things are sort of starting to settle a little? Um, I think um, behind the scenes, they're probably a bit stressed, but they don't really show it at all. I think my mum probably worries about it more than my dad, um, just because he's like a really chill person. We're quite lucky. <laughs> yeah. Look, just it's been awesome to get to know you a little bit. Um, I really appreciate you being on the podcast and sharing your story. I wish you all the best with the recovery ongoing. And I think it's going to make you an amazing nurse, next level amazing. And Thank you. at such a young age, uh, I think it's going to give you a lot of life experience early on and you're going to be able to use that in a real positive way. Um, although I understand that it's challenging and I would have much preferred not to be having a conversation with you about a stroke that you had. Yeah, thank you. That's really kind. <laughs> Same to you. <laughs> Discover how to support your recovery after stroke. Go to recoveryafterstroke.com.